Hello, Dan here. Um, today I'm going to read something from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, I first read her stuff in this book, Gathering Moss, which is all about moss and is a brilliant book. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is subtitled Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants. And I'll read uh, an essay called Asters and Goldenrod. The girl in the picture holds a slate with her name and class of 75 chalked in. A girl the colour of deerskin with long hair and inky unreadable eyes that meet yours and won't look away. I remember that day. I was wearing the new plaid shirt that my parents had given me, an outfit I thought to be the hallmark of all foresters. When I look back at the photo in later life, it was a puzzle to me. I recall being elated to be going to college, but there is no trace of that in the girl's face. Even before I arrived at school, I had all of my answers prepared for the freshman intake interview. I wanted to make a good first impression. There were hardly any women at the forestry school in those days, and certainly none who looked like me. The advisor peered at me over his glasses and said, So, why do you want to major in botany? His pencil was paused over the registrar's form. How could I answer? How could I tell him that I was born a botanist, that I had shoe boxes of seeds and piles of pressed leaves under my bed, that I'd stop my bike along the road to identify a new species, that plants coloured my dreams, that the plants had chosen me. So I told him the truth. I was proud of my well-planned answer, its freshman sophistication apparent to anyone, the way it showed that I already knew some plants and their habitats, that I had thought deeply about their nature and was clearly well prepared for college work. I told him that I chose botany because I wanted to learn about why asters and goldenrod looked so beautiful together. I'm sure I was smiling then in my red plaid shirt, but he was not. He laid down his pencil as if there was no need to record what I had said. Miss Wall, he said, fixing me with a disappointed smile, I must tell you that that is not science. That is not at all the sort of thing with which botanists concern themselves. But he promised to put me right. I'll enrol you in general botany so you can learn what it is. And so it began. I like to imagine that they were the first flowers I saw over my mother's shoulder as the pink blanket slipped away from my face and their colours flooded my consciousness. I've heard that early experience can attune the brain to certain stimuli so that they are processed with greater speed and certainty so that they can be used again and again so that we remember. Love at first sight. Through cloudy newborn eyes their radiance formed the first botanical synapses in my wide awake newborn brain which until then had encountered only the blurry gentleness of pink faces. I'm guessing all eyes were on me, a little round baby, all swaddled in bunting, but mine were on goldenrod and asters. I was born to these flowers and they came back for my birthday every year, weaving me into our mutual celebration. People flock to our hills for the fiery sweet of October, but they oft often miss the sublime prelude of September fields. As if harvest time were not enough, peaches, grapes, sweet corn, squash. The fields are also embroidered with drifts of golden yellow and pools of deepest purple, a masterpiece. If a fountain could jet bouquets of chrome yellow in dazzling arches of chrysanthemum fireworks, that would be Canada goldenrod. Each three-foot stem is a geezer of tiny gold daisies, ladylike in miniature, exuberant on mass. Where the soil is damp enough, they stand side by side with their perfect counterpart, New England asters, not the pale domesticates of the perennial border, the weak source of lavender or sky blue, but full-on royal purple that would make a violet shrink. The daisy-like fringe of purple petals surrounds a disc as bright 
as the sun at high noon, a golden orange pool just a tantalising shade darker than the surrounding goldenrod. Alone, each is a botanical superlative. Together, the visual effect is stunning. Purple and gold, the heraldic colours of the king and queen of the meadow, a regal procession in complementary colours. I just wanted to know why. Why do they stand beside each other when they could grow alone? Why this particular pair? There are plenty of pinks and whites and blues dotting the fields. So it's only happenstance that the magnificence of purple and gold end up side by side. Einstein himself said that God doesn't play dice with the universe. What is the source of this pattern? Why is the world so beautiful? It could so easily be otherwise. Flowers could be ugly to us and still fulfil their own purpose. But they're not. It seemed like a good question to me. But my advisor said, it's not science. Not what botany was about. I wanted to know why certain stems bent easily for baskets and some would break, why the biggest berries grew in the shade and why they made us medicines, which plants are edible, why those little pink orchids only grow under pines. Not science, he said, and he ought to know, sitting in his laboratory, a learned professor of botany, and if you want to study beauty, you should go to art school. He reminded me of my deliberations over choosing a college when I had vacillated between training as a botanist or as a poet. Since everyone told me I couldn't do both, I'd chosen plants. He told me that science was not about beauty, not about the embrace between plants and humans. I had no rejoinder. I had made a mistake. There was no fight in me, only embarrassment at my error. I did not have the words for resistance. He signed me up for my classes and I was dismissed to go get my photo taken for registration. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was happening all over again, an echo of my grandfather's first day at school, when he was ordered to leave everything, language, culture, family, behind. The professor made me doubt where I came from, what I knew, and claimed that his was the right way to think, only he didn't cut my hair off. In moving from a childhood in the woods to the university, I had unknowingly shifted between world views, from a natural history of experience in which I knew plants as teachers and companions to whom I was linked with mutual responsibility, into the realm of science. The questions scientists raised were not, who are you, but what is it? No one asked plants, what can you tell us? The primary question was, how does it work? The botany I was taught was reductionist, mechanistic and strictly objective. Plants were reduced to objects, they were not subjects. The way botany was conceived and taught didn't seem to leave much room for a person who thought the way I did. The only way I could make sense of it was to conclude that the things I had always believed about plants must not be true after all. That first plant science class was a disaster. I barely scraped by with a C and could not muster much enthusiasm for memorising the concentrations of essential plant nutrients. There were times when I wanted to quit, but the more I learned, the more fascinated I became with the intricate structures that make up a leaf and the alchemy of photosynthesis. Companionship between asters and goldenrod was never mentioned, but I memorised botanical Latin as if it was poetry, eagerly tossing aside the name goldenrod for solidago canadensis. I was mesmerised by plant ecology, evolution, taxon taxonomy, physiology, soils and fungi. All around me were my good teachers, the plants. I found good mentors too, warm and kind professors who were doing heart-driven science, whether they could admit it or not. They too were my teachers. And yet there was always something tapping at my shoulder, willing me to turn around. When I did, I did not know how to recognise what stood behind me. My natural inclination was to see relationships, to seek the threads that connect the world, to join instead of divide. But science is rigorous in separating the observer from the observed, and the observed from the observer. Why two flowers are beautiful together would violate the division necessary for objectivity. 
I scarcely doubted the primacy of scientific thought. Following the path of science trained me to separate, to distinguish perception from physical reality, to atomise complexity into its smallest components, to honour the chain of evidence and logic, to discern one thing from another, to savour the pleasure of precision. The more I did this, the better I got at it, and I was accepted to do graduate work in one of the world's finest botany programmes, no doubt on the strength of the letter of recommendation from my advisor which read, she's done remarkably well for an Indian girl. A master's degree, a PhD and a faculty position followed. I'm grateful for the knowledge that was shared with me and deeply privileged to carry, carry the powerful tools of science as a way of engaging the world. It took me to other plant communities far from the asters and goldenrod. I remember feeling as a new faculty member as if I finally understood plants. I too began to teach the mechanics of botany, emulating the approach that I had been taught. It reminds me of a story told by my friend Holly Young Bear Tibbetts. A plant scientist armed with his notebooks and equipment is exploring the rainforests for new botanical discoveries and he has hired an indigenous guide to lead him. Knowing the scientist's interest, the young guide takes care to point out the interesting species. The botanist looks at him appraisingly, surprised by his capacity. Well, well, young man, you certainly know the names of a lot of these plants. The guide nods and replies with downcast eyes. Yes, I have learned the names of all the bushes, but I have yet to learn their songs. I was teaching the names and ignoring the songs. When I was in graduate school in Wisconsin, my then husband and I had the good fortune to land jobs as caretakers at the University Arboretum. In return for a little house at the edge of the prairie, we had only to make the nighttime rounds, checking that doors and gates were secure before we left the darkness to the crickets. There was just one time that a light was left burning, a door left ajar in the horticulture garage. There was no mischief, but as my husband checked around, I stood and idly scanned the bulletin board. There was a news clipping there with a photo of a magnificent American elm, which had just been named the champion for its species, the largest of its kind. It had a name, the Louis Vieux elm. My heart began to pound, and I knew my world was about to change, for I'd known the name Louis Vieux all my life, and here was his face looking at me from a news clipping. He was our Potawatomi grandfather, one who had walked all the way from Wisconsin forests to the Kansas prairie with my grandma, Charnote. He was a leader, one who took care of the people in their hardship. That garage door was left ajar, that light was left burning, and it shone on the path back home for me. It was the beginning of a long, slow journey back to my people, called out to me by the tree that stood above their bones. To walk the science path, I had stepped off the path of indigenous knowledge, but the world has a way of guiding your steps. Seemingly out of the blue came an invitation to a small gathering of native elders to talk about traditional knowledge of plants. One I will never forget, a Navajo woman without a day of university botany training in her life spoke for hours and I hung on every word. One by one, name by name, she told of the plants in her valley, where each one lived, when it bloomed, who it liked to live near, and all its relationships, who ate it, who lined their nests with its fibres, what kind of medicine it offered. She also shared the stories held by those plants, their origin myths, how they got their names, and what they have to tell us. She spoke of beauty. Her words were like smelling salts, walking me to what I had known back when I was picking strawberries. I realised how shallow my understanding was. Her knowledge was so much deeper and wider and engaged all the human ways of understanding. She could have explained asters and goldenrod. To a new PhD this was humbling. It was the beginning of my reclaiming that other way of knowing that I had helplessly let science supplant. I felt like a malnourished refugee, invited to a feast, the dishes scented with the herbs of home. I circled right back to where I had begun, to the questions of beauty, back to the questions that science does not ask. Not because they aren't important, but because science as a way of knowing is too narrow for the task. Had my advisor been a better scholar, 
He would have celebrated my questions, not dismissed them. He offered me only the cliché that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And since science separates the observer and the observed, by definition, beauty could not be a valid scientific question. I should have been told that my questions were bigger than science could touch. He was right about beauty being in the eye of the beholder, especially when it comes to purple and yellow. Colour perception in humans relies on banks of specialised receptor cells, the rods and cones in the retina. The job of the cone cells is to absorb light of different wavelengths and pass it on to the brain's visual cortex, where it can be interpreted. The visible light spectrum, the rainbow of colours, is broad, so the most effective means of discerning colour is not one generalised jack-of-all-trades cone cell, but rather an array of specialists each perfectly tuned to absorb certain wavelengths. The human eye has three kinds. One type excels at det detecting red and associated wavelengths. One is tuned to blue. The other optimi optimally perceives light of two colours, purple and yellow. The human eye is superbly equipped to detect these colours and send a signal pulsing to the brain. This doesn't explain why I perceive them as beautiful, but it does explain why that combination gets my undivided attention. I asked my artist buddies about the power of purple and gold, and they sent me right to the colour wheel. These two are complementary colours, as different in nature as could be. In composing a palette, putting them together makes each more vivid. Just a touch of one will bring out the other. In an 1890 treatise on colour perception, Goethe who was both a scientist and a poet, wrote that the colours diametrically opposed to each other are those which reciprocally evoke each other in the eye. Purple and yellow are a reciprocal pair. Our eyes are so sensitive to these wavelengths that the cones can get oversaturated and the stimulus pours over into the other cells. A printmaker I know showed me that if you stare for a long time at a block of yellow and then shift your gaze to a white sheet of paper, you will see it for a moment as violet. This phenomenon, the colour, coloured after image, occurs because there is energetic reciprocity between purple and yellow pigments, which Goldenrod and Astors knew well before we did. If my advisor was correct, the visual effect that so delights a human like me may be irrelevant to the flowers. The real beholder, whose eyes they hope to catch, is a bee bent on pollination. Bees perceive many flowers differently than humans do due to their perception of additional spectra such as ultraviolet radiation. As it turns out though, goldenrod and asters appear very similarly to bee eyes and human eyes. We both think they're beautiful. Their striking contrast when they grow together makes them the most attractive target in the whole meadow, a beacon for bees. Growing together, both receive more pollinator visits than they would if they were growing alone. It's a testable hypothesis. It's a question of science, a question of art, and a question of beauty. Why are they beautiful together? It is a phenomenon st simultaneously material and spiritual, for which we need all wavelengths, for which we need depth perception. When I stare too long at the world with science eyes, I see an afterimage of traditional knowledge. Might science and traditional knowledge be purple and yellow to one another? Might they be goldenrod and asters? We see the world more fully when we use both. The question of goldenrod and asters was, of course, just emblematic of what I really wanted to know. It was an architecture of relationships, of connections that I yearned to understand. I wanted to see the shimmering threads that hold it all together. And I wanted to know why we love the world, why the most ordinary scrap of meadow can rock us back on our heels in awe. When botanists go walking the forests and fields looking for plants, we say they are going on a foray. When writers do the same, we should call it a metaphore, and the land is rich in both. We need them both. Scientist and poet Geoffrey Burton Russell writes that, as the sign of a deeper truth, metaphor was close to sacrament. Because the vastness and richness of reality cannot be expressed by the overt sense of a statement alone. Native scholar Greg Kekete has written that in indigenous ways of knowing we understand a thing only when we understand it with all four aspects of our being, 
mind, body, emotion and spirit. I came to understand quite sharply when I began my training as a scientist that science privileges only one, possibly two, of these ways of knowing, mind and body. As a young person wanting to know everything about plants, I did not question this, but it is a whole human being who finds the beautiful path. There was a time when I teetered precariously with an awkward foot in each of the two worlds, the scientific and the indigenous, but then I learned to fly, or at least try. It was the bees that showed me how to move between different flowers, to drink the nectar and gather pollen from both. It is this dance of cross-pollination that can produce a new species of knowledge, a new way of being in the world. After all, there aren't two worlds. There is just this one good green earth. That September pairing of purple and gold is lived reciprocity. Its wisdom is that the beauty of one is illuminated by the radiance of the other. Science and art, matter and spirit, indigenous knowledge and Western science. Can they be goldenrod and asters for each other? When I am in their presence, their beauty asks me for reciprocity to be the complementary colour, to make something beautiful in response. That was from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer.